acute pericarditis, constrictive pericarditis, pericardial tamponade, all very easy and fun to study. Let's learn them together. Okay, so let's start with acute pericarditis first. But what is pericarditis again? Itis means inflammation. Inflammation of what? Of the pericardium. And what is the pericardium? So peri means around and cardium obviously means the heart. So pericardium is a membrane around the heart. So this membrane has two layers. The outer one is the fibrous one and the inner portion is the serous membrane. So the serous membrane has two portions. The visceral layer which is right on top of the heart and the parietal layer is the outer layer of the serous membrane. Most commonly the pericarditis is due to idiopathic reasons which are unknown, right? But from the ones we know, the most common ones include viruses, especially the Kuksaki B virus and influenza virus, some bacteria like Staphylococcus and Streptococcus species, TB, which is uh, tuberculosis, especially in endemic areas. So always think of this while reading the vignettes, okay? Endemic areas, uh, immigrants, etc. Uh, other causes include uremia with BUN more than 60, all right? And here, uh, a side note, uremic pericarditis does not cause the typical diffuse ST elevation and PR depressions, as we will see in a bit, but rather presents with non-specific T-wave changes and we treat it with dialysis, okay? Not with NSAIDs, as we will see in a bit. Also radiation, rheumatic fever, cancer, aortic dissection, MI, SLE, along with other uh, connective tissue disorders, can all cause pericarditis. Another cause is the post-MI pericarditis, which is subdivided into early pericarditis, uh, which appears less than four days after MI, and late pericarditis, which we also, um, uh, which is also known as Dressler syndrome. Okay, so let's see how uh, is our patient gonna present. Okay, so patient having acute pericarditis will present with chest pain. Yes, CP stands for chest pain. When a patient with chest pain comes to you, what do you do first? You're doing an EKG. Yes, why? To rule out MI. Okay, so you do an EKG. What are you going to see on the EKG? Diffuse ST elevations and diffuse PR depressions. And when I say diffuse, I mean in all leads, all right? So if it was MI, it would have been focal changes, right? But here it's diffuse in all leads. Now here, the chest pain in the vignette, they might tell you, oh, the patient's chest pain uh, gets better when he sits, when he's sitting upright and it gets worse when he's lying down. So this is another clue for you to start thinking of acute pericarditis. Now, um, moreover, you want to ask who take the patient, right? So what are you going to hear? The hallmark of acute pericarditis, which is pericardial friction rub. Perfect. You're doing great. So, uh, by the way, on step one and step two, they lie, giving you hard sounds to diagnose, to listen to and to diagnose. So I would highly recommend that you start listening hard sounds online if you don't have direct uh, access to patients. So you, start, you get used to diagnosing these hard sounds and recognizing the different ones uh, so you can uh, diagnose them fast on exam day, all right? So uh, also you want to do a cardiac echo throughout uh, pericardial effusion in this patient. Okay, so we diagnosed our patient with acute pericarditis. What do we do next? Well, we can treat him, right? Okay, so let's see how we treat him. We treat acute pericarditis with high doses of NSAIDs, all right? So we can, you can choose from, uh, say, aspirin. You can use aspirin. You can start the patient uh, on 650 to 1000 milligrams every six to eight hours. Or you can use ibuprofen, 400 to 800 milligrams every eight hours. Or you can use which one? Which other one? Indomethacin. So indomethacin, you can give them 50 milligrams every eight hours. Now, you don't need to remember the dosages, but if you want to remember them, it won't hurt <laughs> for your future clinical practice. Um, all right, so very important to remember here is that you should taper the NSAIDs over two to four weeks to prevent recurrences okay, of the pericarditis, all right? So um, 
you can also add here to the uh, treatment plan coercicine, right? Coercicine. You can use it for up to three months to prevent again recurrences. And remember, the side effects of coercicine are GI distress, uh, less commonly myositis, hepatotoxicity, and uh, bone marrow suppression. And also, you can treat with corticosteroids. Um, please avoid them in viral uh, pericarditis. Avoid them also uh, several days after MI because they can lead to rupture of the right ventricle. And uh, uh, you can use them uh, when um, the pericarditis doesn't uh, reply to your NSAIDs treatment and also in uh, immunologic conditions that uh, cause the pericarditis. All right, so any cause that can lead to acute pericarditis and left untreated can cause chronic pericarditis. And chronic pericarditis manifests with what? What are you thinking of? Yes, fibrosis and calcification of the pericardium. Now imagine a fibrous pericardium. You, you're imagining it shrunken, right? Shrunken and wrinkled and all that. So what do you think is going to happen to the right ventricle and diastolic volume uh, due to the fact that the pericardium outside of the heart is so shrunken and it constricts the heart? Yes, you're right. So during diastole, the right ventricle will not be able to expand to its full maximum because the pericardium is pushing it, right? So it's gonna fill up up until mid diastole and then it's gonna stop because there's no more lumen, there's no more space to expand. As a result, as we said, the um, end diastolic right ventricular volume will decrease, which will lead to decreasing the cardiac output, which will lead to fatigue on exertion, right? Um, also, when the blood is backing up, right atrium and the uh, vena cavus, right, because it cannot enter the right ventricle, it's gonna lead to um, edema and fluid overload, ascites and all that. But also you're gonna see heptojugular reflex. What is this? So a heptojugular reflex presents with, when you press here on the right side on top of the liver, your veins here, your uh, jugular veins will pop out, will engorge, all right, because there is fluid overload. It, it, it cannot go to the heart. All right, so what else are you gonna see? Kuzmao sign. So what is Kuzmao sign? Kuzmao sign is uh, when you inhale, you will notice that again, your jugular veins are, in, uh, are popping out, are, in, uh, are enlarging. Why is this? Because normally when you inhale, you draw blood to your right part of the heart. And this is normal. But if, if, but if your right ventricle cannot expand, you won't be able to draw this, uh, uh, the same amount of blood into the right ventricle, right? So it's gonna back up to the head and to uh, the, the rest of the body. So this is Kuzmao sign. Increased JVD on inhalation. All right, so you're gonna see pericardial knock, why? So again, like I said, um, when the right ventricle in mid diastole, as it's filling, hit the stiff pericardium. You're gonna see, uh, you're gonna hear pericardial knock uh, with your stethoscope. Also on EKG, you're gonna see low voltage, low voltage QRS, like small ones in height. And on uh, uh, jugular venous pressure tracings, you're gonna see X and Y descents. And what is the best initial test for uh, diagnosing constrictive pericarditis? Yes, it is chest x-ray. And what is the most accurate one? It is the CT scan and the MRI of the chest. By the way, the MRI is also the most accurate test for diagnosing acute pericarditis as well. And the definite treatment here is, of course, with pericardiectomy. Okay, so you basically you uh, take away, you surgically remove part of the fibrosed pericardium. All right, and here, very important, please remember that you can give them diuretics before performing the surgery, so you can relieve the symptoms of fluid overload. Last but not least, let's discuss the pericardial tamponade. And what is pericardial tamponade? It's basically fluid accumulation in between the two main layers of the pericardium, the outer fibrous one and the inner serous one. And uh, uh, similarly to our constrictive pericarditis, it will lead to decreased filling of the uh, right ventricle. Basically, decrease of uh, blood return to the right heart. And if they ask you which part of the right heart will collapse first in pericardial tamponade, 
it will be the right atrium because it's much weaker than the right ventricle, right? If the, and if they ask you in pericardial tamponade during diastole, which ventricle will collapse first? The answer is the right ventricle. Why? Because the right ventricle is weaker than the left ventricle. Left ventricle is more muscular one because as we know is the main pumping chamber of the heart. And what do you think the causes of pericardial tamponade can be? Yes, let's start with aortic dissection type A first, right? As we discussed in our uh, aortic dissection video that you can of course check out. Other causes include chest trauma, most commonly stab wounds to the chest, malignancies, most commonly lung and breast cancer. Other causes include SLE, TB and also patients after uh, cabbage procedure, after uh, the first few days after cabbage procedure, coronary artery bypass grafting, they're also very prone to pericardial tamponade. Okay, so normally there is a little bit of fluid in between the two main layers of the pericardium, the fibrous, the outer one and the serous, the inner one. So this fluid can prevent friction of the pericardium as the heart moves around in it, right? But sudden accumulation of around 500 milliliters of fluid uh, in between uh, the two layers of the, peri uh, of the pericardium can lead to acute pericardial tamponade, all right? But um, if this accumulation of fluid or blood happens chronically over several months, the pericardial sac can accommodate more than two liters of fluid. Can you imagine that? More than two liters of fluid before the patient actually presents with uh, sign and symptoms of pericardial tamponade. And what are the sign and symptoms? Let's check it out. Uh, okay, so person with pericardial tamponade will present with pulses paradoxus. And what is this? It's basically drop in systolic blood pressure with more than 10 millimeters of merc mercury on inspiration. Okay, so uh, post paradoxus, by the way, you can also see in constrictive pericarditis. Also here, uh, of course, you're going to see the famous Bex triad, which consists of hypotension, decreased blood pressure, uh, decreased heart sounds or distant heart sounds, and JVD, all right? Okay, so on EKG, of course, you're gonna find also something very pathognomonic of pericardial tamponade, and the phenomenon is called electrical alternance. Okay, electrical alternance. Okay, and what is this exactly? It basically um, describes different heights of the QRS complex uh, in the different leads of the EKG. But that's all it is. Also here, uh, you can also see uh, sinus tachy. You can actually only see sinus tachy without the electrical alternance, but you can orient yourself about this diagnosis uh, from the vignette and from the other symptoms that they give you. Okay, sinus tachy. Uh, also on echo, when you do echo, uh, you're gonna see, of course, as we said, the right atrium and ventricular collapse during diastole. And how do you think we treat uh, pericardial tamponade? Yes, you're right, with pericardial synthesis. You basically put a needle uh, in between the layers of the pericardium and you drain the fluid out of there. All right, so also you want to give them uh, IV fluids and pressors in these patients to stabilize them hemodynamically. But remember here you do not give them diuretics because if you give them diuretics, the right ventricle filling uh, will decrease even more, right? Because you will deplete them of fluid. So it's very, very bad to give them diuretics uh, as the right ventricle will collapse and uh, it can be fatal to your patient, okay? So remember in constrictive pericarditis, give them diuretics to decrease the volume overload, but here in pericardial tamponade, give them the opposite, give them IV fluids and even pressors before you perform the pericardial synthesis. So this concludes our pericardial diseases video. Thank you very much for watching. Um, actually, this video will cover, if not all, then most of your questions on um, all steps and um, I always encourage you to read more if possible as we all know that knowing is cool and knowledge is power. <laughs> so um, I remind you again to subscribe to our channel and to hit the bell button behind it so you can receive notifications 
as we upload the new videos and we have tons of highest videos coming up for you guys. Uh, I would also like to hear from you in the comment section below what you thought about this video and thank you again for watching and see you on the next video.